Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, dicers, slicers, and curry spicers, welcome along to the Joe Spivey YouTube channel where we discuss books and little else. And welcome back to Random Reviews, folks, where we take usually a canonical classic, but otherwise just something that I've been reading recently, lay it out in the anatomical position, put it on the bed, and uh, slit it open and see what is uh, at its fundament, what's going on underneath. Um, just very briefly before we do get into that, um, I've been watch watching YouTube, as is my want recently, and I've run into uh, a gentleman called Winston Marshall, who is uh, a new YouTuber uh, and has been on podcasts before. He was a band member uh, and was cancelled because, uh, oh, I don't know whether cancelled would be the right word, but he was, he was yeah, he was ostracised slightly and uh, discredited and defamed uh, for essentially liking Jordan Peterson, I think, uh, rather than being a mindless nerf or whatever. But um, yeah, he has got a, 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 a ludicrously well-produced channel, despite having, I think, almost fewer subscribers than we have on here. Um, but anyway, he was on a podcast the other day, and I was watching that just this morning, and um, he was uh, asked how, just how much he reads by one of the, the presenters, because somebody had told him that, somebody had told the presenter that Winston Marshall was a big reader, and he sort of looked away into the distance like Clint Eastwood would in a western or something like that just sort of you know a thousand yard stone says you know oh, sometimes I read 50 pages a day brother <laughs> and everybody everybody else in the studio was completely bamboozled by this 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 gargantuan that they assumed must have just escaped a nuclear containment facility you know is it a bird is it a plane no it's the man that reads 50 pages a day come to destroy us all look at him athwart us um <laughs> Little do they know that people like us exist, folks, who trounce through thousand-page books in seven, five, four, five, six days. Um, but anyway, <laughs> I just thought I'd share with you the fact that you, you do always have to reacquaint yourself with the fact that, um, you know, most people read nothing but a greeting card from the age of 18 until they perish, unfortunately. So anyway, let us get on to random reviews. This is uh, Martin Amos's The War Against Cliché, folks. Um, and this is an essay collection of uh, his book reviews, or, you know, an assortment of his book reviews between the years 1971 to about, I think it's 2000, yeah, 1971 to 2000, when he was in his pomp, in his, at his peak, really, at the peak of his powers, when he was young and bristling and would wear dark blue jumpers and white blue shirts and had long hair and all of that type of thing. Um, and yes, this is, essay collections uh, puzzle me, really. They are the closest thing that I get to short form content. Uh, you know, that stuff that, you know, the reels and the TikToks and the YouTube shorts that so beleaguer um, the youth and uh, increasingly the middle age and the, 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 the uh, the, the, the oldies these days as well. Um, the idea of moving from one thing to the next, obviously not at the egregious scale um, and microcosmic level that TikTok would, uh, uh, br you know, sort of beleaguer you with, um, but you still you still feel as if you're moving, you know, within, it might take you five minutes to read the article, or 15 minutes to read the book of you, but you feel as if you're entering something new each time, often, if it's not done particularly well. Uh, but that, thankfully, is not the case with this. A little bit of context, if you're new to the channel, welcome. Martin Amis is one of my, I don't know whether it would be highfalutin to say literary fathers, or, you know, he, he is, he, uh, he is one of the four or five things uh, without which, or, or without ha having in, uh, come into contact with whom, I would probably not be uh, sat in front of an iPad uh, uh, prevaricating at such uh, embuggering length. Um, so yes, along with you know oxygen, polysaturated fats, uh, nitrogen, and then Martin Amis. That's, that's the reason I'm still I'm, I'm here. Um, so yes, but during my edification, when I was in my early twenties, he I, I then started to look askance at his fiction, folks. Really, I think they're just. They seem to be just sort of crotch itchings. They're not. They're just very unserious, very really sort of gimmicky. There's clearly a sort of a, 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 a desire to be um, literarily significant. There's, there's clearly something in his fiction that, you know, obviously it, it drew me in and got me through the door. But as soon as you start to read widely and and more, uh, per, you know, predominantly with the classics, you soon realise that it's 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 mostly just bilge and you know emptying pint glasses of lager and. Um, uh, uh, not so much seducing, but just grabbing hold of the girl next door, uh, frankly. But this is very, very different, which is what makes non Martin Amis' non-fiction all the more complex and puzzling for me, folks. Because this is absolutely marvellous. Superb, in fact. Um, it is serious, it is pointed, it is... I'm talking about it as though it's one discrete thing. They are serious and humorous and pointed and deliberate and professional and precise and mature and 
yeah, just just bristling with all of all of the great personality, all of the you know all of the wonder of money and London Fields and the Rachel Papers, all of all of the stuff that makes you grin, all of the things that make you want to be dumb, um, all of that stuff, and yet they have a, a kind of scholarly, academic, um, objective judgmental, judicious backing to them. They have a, they have a legitimization, they have a, um, you know, sort of establishment backing. They're, they're really, really good. They're really fought out. Um, so yeah, a few sections that I wanted to highlight, things that I wanted to talk about, and to alert you all to the fact that this is going to be a little used uh, or referred to, uh, employed and utilized in my discussion with <coughs> Steve Donahue in, uh, I think probably about 24 hours from now. I'm having him on this channel for the first time. I'm usually a guest on his ship, um, but we're going to welcome him up the plank uh, to the Spivey, to HMS Spivey. And um, yeah, we're gonna be talking to him tomorrow and I'm gonna be using this because he is of course a book critic, um, not uh, nearly as well uh, remunerated uh, as Martin Amos, I'm sure, or, or, or well known or revered, um, but a book critic nonetheless. Um, um, yes, yeah, so this the, the first section studies um, so sort of cultural cornerstones. So there are bits on violence in films and um, Margaret Thatcher's Britain and the what Amos calls the phosphorescent prosperity. Just let that one sink in, folks. Phosphorescent prosperity of uh, 80s, 70s and 80s Britain. And um, what else? There's a, there's a biography of Lincoln as well. So, yeah, this is the first section that we're going to look at. Um, I am in blood stepped, uh, I am in blood stepped in so far. Um, so this is about, yeah, violence in films. Uh, so just, just settle down, get yourself a whiskey or, you know, get in the, get, you know, get, get your little dog on your lap, whatever it is you need to do. Um, so this is about violence. Before then, violence wasn't violent. People often talk, usually disapprovingly, about the way violence has become stylized on film. But the old violence was stylized too. It simply wore the soft gloves of much gentler conventions. Writing in the 50s, Nabokov noted the ineffectuality of the ox-stunning fisticuffs of an average cinematic rumble, and remarked on the speed with which the hero invariably recovered from a plethora of pain that would have hospitalized a Hercules. Few of us are in a position to say which style is the more lifelike, the cartoonish invulnerability of the old violence or the cartoonish besplatterings of the new. We imagine that reality lies somewhere in between, that is, less dramatic, less balletic, and uh, above all, quicker. In life, the average fist fight, for instance, lasts about a second and consists of one blow. The loser gets a broken nose, the winner gets a broken hand, and they trudge off to emergency. Thus, the great Stallone joins the queue at the trauma unit while Chuck Norris fumbles with his first aid kit. It just wouldn't play. Now, you see there, that is a book about Hollywood versus America by Michael Medved. The book hasn't been reviewed yet, it hasn't even mentioned the thing, and in the 2,000 words that Amos is commissioned to write about it, I references it every now and then, but they, they, these reviews seem to be just uh, a vehicle along which Amos can flex his uh, intellectual muscle, but I'm all in for it, folks, thank, uh, frankly. Uh, this, is, this is where he actually does um, give himself some elbow room and really does uh, uh, talk about the book, heaven forbid. Uh, this is uh, Lincoln by David Herbert Donald. Uh, the new Lincoln is a utilitarian biography of detail, a desk job about a desk job. David Herbert Donald, of set purpose, has denied himself the broad context, the big pictures of perspective and hindsight, uh, and uh, America, convulsing and pollulating in the background, remains strictly undynamic. The South is altogether unexamined, uh, remains strict, uh, and is, its president, Jefferson Davis, is merely a named adversary. The origins and aftermath of the Civil War are not examined, and neither is its tragic course. This is a history of memos and dispatches and late nights in the White House. The great social torments and exhilarations of these years do not buffet the narrative. What Professor Donald offers is the verisimilitude of marathon anxiety. There you are, you see. So how often have you read a big biography of a president or a huge thing of Napoleon or of Lenin or of Alexander the Great and you just get all of this uh, 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 nonsense about, well not nonsense, but, but what can be sometimes, you know, uh, ineffectual detritus of you know, non-fiction talking about uh, the amount of bottles he received as a child or what was going on 30 miles away, 30 years before the events taking place are described. And Amos rightly needles that. And you can see there that, he, yeah, you sense an affection for reading and for, uh, you, can, you can always tell that Amos is sat there grinning in his chair, just, just writing this out and it's all coming to him with uh, a, 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 um, 
a sort of a jealousy inducing uh, rapidity and ease uh, that's what it seems to be anyway but but he was quite a hard worker as well um so this is from the canon he goes on to, to talk about Coleridge and Jane Austen and uh, there's bits on um Don Quixote as well um so this is talking about uh yes some of Coleridge's it's it's a Col the, the the book being reviewed is Coleridge's verse a selection edited by William Empson and David Pyrie I think is it pronounced um uh, Professor, it's only a quick quotation, Professor Empson's empiricism does lead him to see the creative process as far more furtive and equivocal than most of us would be willing to accept. But as always, he is learned, lively, and often most stimulating when he is wrong. And there we have the, one of the first little bits of idiosyncrasy brought in by him. It's, the, the book's called The War Against Cliché. Those, um, the, you know, the, the, the um, sort of, the, yeah, the bullet points that, that presenters usually refer to when they are, yeah, when they're, when they're presenting something or when somebody's writing about something or talking about something, um, you know, things that grind their gears, what gets you out of bed in the morning, um, you know, skeletons in the closet, uh, um, th turns of phrase that have become uh, uh, so solidified and just so overused and, and, and so cheapened um, that people don't even realise that they're inventions anymore and they, they, they feel as if they're just, you know, uh, vocabulary normalcy when in fact it is just all just artifice and, and people that just, just use them as a sort of verbal tick when they don't know what to say or what, what to write, heaven forbid. Um, so yes, he, he's angling against um, sort of, yeah, uh, 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 laxity and of, um, yeah, a, a kind of, uh, on, here, on, on the reviewer's part and on a writer's part, on a, uh, a complacency as well and, and, a, and a wanting just to get copy out of the door. Um, so this is uh, a tinkering with Jane. This is Sanderton, which was um, an unknown, uh, an unfinished book by Jane Austen that was completed by, um, I think, a professional writer in, I didn't know about this actually, which is really interesting. Um, so this is, yeah, criticising Jane Austen. <laughs> of course, Jane's prose is not nearly as inimitable as Janeites will lead you to believe. And the collaborator is able to reproduce the tart periodicity of her sentences in a blithe, unselfconscious way, with a minimum of toe stubbing, though without much of the panache and, as and asperity of her original. Uh, and then he goes on to the next page to talk about um, the not tropes of, an uh, of a typically Austenian novel, but what he finds uh, occurs most uh, commonly. Uh, the progress towards the Austen manage tends to be one of self improvement rather than self discovery. Each protagonist has to turn into the sort of person whom the other deserves to marry, and you're meant to feel that the need for correction will continue long after the symbolic final kiss. Um, and then he goes on to talk about some of his erstwhile American favourites. We've got Normal Mailer in here. We've got, uh, this is the bit that I really, really enjoyed most. This was, um, uh, it's, it's titled Vidal's Mirror, uh, and it's a review of Gore Vidal's, um, is it a memoir? Yeah, his palimpsest. Um, so this is a, a, a reasonably long section. Um, Gore Vidal's palimpsest is a tale of the unexpected, contemplating its arty, finicky title, its handsomely integrated photographs, its bulk, its celebrity-infested index. One gears oneself for predictable pleasures. Namely, the invigoratingly high-plumed cynicism of Vidal's discursive prose, plus plenty of gossip. Now that would put most writers out of, um, you know, out of action for a week. That kind of sentence and that kind of deliberation, that kind of insight, would have them, you know, resorting to, uh, the, the, you know, the South Coast for three weeks. They've worked so hard on that sentence, but Amos just churns it out and goes on absent-mindedly. I thought I was wise to all his moves. I knew Vidal would have me frowning and nodding and smiling and smirking with admiration and exasperation and scandalised dissent. I never dreamed Vidal would have me piping my eyes and stirring wanly out of the window and emitting strange sighs, many of them frail and elderly in timber. Approaching 70, Vidal now takes cognizance of the human heart and reveals that he has one. Palimpsest is a tremendous read from start to finish. It is also a proud and serious and truthful book. Um, and that was, yeah, what I wanted to pick up because it was, it goes on like that for, for 2,000 words and it's absolutely excellent. Um, and he's also really rather, um, not scurrilous because he can always back up what he's saying, but he is uh, scathing and um, he, being young, as, as I'm sure you can uh, uh, tell from, you know, it's, I'm sure you can detect from some of my more vitriolic pronouncements, being young gives you some kind of wiggle room in order to be uh, ridiculously critical of both your elders and the world at large. Um, which I do really rather often, I'm afraid. And uh, Mr. Amos does it in prose brilliantly here. So this is Broken Lance, uh, The Adventures of Don Quixote. It's, it was a new translation by uh, uh, Tobias Smollett, I think it's pronounced. I'll just take a quick swig. So this is his opening um, 
This is the opening slash of it. Uh, while clearly an impregnable masterpiece, Don Quixote suffers from one fairly serious flaw, that of outright unreadability. This reviewer should know, because he has just read it. The book bristles with beauties, charm, sublime comedy. It is also, for long stretches, approaching about 75% of the whole, inhumanly dull. Looming like one of Don's chimerical adversaries, it is a giant with, uh, and then quotes it, yeah, yeah, but the giant has a giant weight problem and is elderly and soft brained. Reading Don Quixote can be compared to an indefinite visit from your most impossible senior relative, with all his pranks, dirty habits, unstoppable reminiscences, and terrible cronies. When the experience is over and the old boy checks out, you will shed tears, all right, not tears of relief or regret, but tears of pride. You made it, despite all that Don Quixote could do. Um, and again, that's that, there's that idiosyncrasy. He doesn't just say it's bad. He says um, it's inhumanly dull, and it's you know, despite everything that he can do, despite everything that Cervantes can do. Um, so yeah, it's, it's yeah, that that's what this is. It's about that, and that's what drew me to Amos originally. He was unlike any you know any any fiction or non-fiction writer that I had ever come across, and um, he retains that in this really really nicely. Um, yeah, he's not just filing crop copy or or trudging around or you know just wanting to get the next thing done and to get through to his um, you know laborious lunch with Christopher Hitchens. He's really considered these, and um, yeah, it's just really nice to read something different and exciting. Uh, for, for not for once because I do read an awful lot of exciting things, but it's yeah, it's 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 nice not to be disgusted by Amos because nowadays I read his fiction and just shake my head and um, whilst sort of in a, uh, a you know a fatherly way thanking or not fatherly way in a, in a yeah yeah I suppose in a fatherly way thanking him for for letting me through the but you know letting me through the turnstiles. Um, I now have to, uh, uh, you know, U-turn and turn back on it. But yes, um, I just, and you just wonder why he couldn't do something like this whilst he was writing his fiction. But anyway, uh, the zone of interest and um, uh, uh, the Times Hour, I suppose, is a little bit of a refutation of that. But yes, uh, that pretty much uh, does for me, Wittering On. Uh, as I say, you shall hopefully be hit with a, uh, a Zoom call with me and uh, uh, a BookTube patron and pariah, Steve Donoghue, on uh, Thursday or Friday. And um, yes, that'll be jolly good. We'll finally get to have him on and um, we'll do some needling of him as he has of us in the past. Um, but yes, that pretty much concludes me today, folks. Uh, I hope you enjoyed uh, my review of The War Against Cliché. Do get yourselves a copy um, if you are, you know, do, if heaven forbid you have a booktube channel of your own or you just want to be able to convey your very specific set of emotions about one book to another human being and, and don't want to do it in a cliched or pastiched or, or, or dull way, then um, you pick up a copy of this and Amos will give you a marvellous template in which to articulate yourself in, a, in, an, in an idiosyncratic way. Um, so yes, thank you ever so much for watching BookTube and goodbye.